when Steve asked me to come along and talk about um, what shareholders, what stakeholders are expecting from annual reports, initially I sort of thought, well, that's, that's an interesting topic. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought this is actually a really good topic. And it's one that at the Institute we're seeing quite a lot of change and quite a lot of excitement in. And um, I'm going to share some of our observations with you about um, annual reporting. Um, first of all, though, I was quite keen to get a little bit of a sense of um, people in the room and whether you know what the Institute of Directors is. Are any of you members been on any of our courses? Could you just raise a hand so I get a... Okay, a little bit. Right. So um, the Institute of Directors is a voluntary membership organisation for directors. We have um, over 8,500 members across New Zealand, have eight branches throughout the country, and we also um, have a very um, diverse membership of people who are involved in governance in all types of different roles. So unlike our title, which might imply it's really just about companies, we're actually about not-for-profits, um, public sector entities, as well as companies and other, other types of entities as well. So um, we produce a lot of resources and we deliver courses. And um, the area that I work in, we, we research and monitor international trends in governance and provide advice to our members about governance best practice. So that's what I'm going to share with you today, a little bit about what we're observing in this space. And um, I thank you for the opportunity to, to share that with you. So I'm going to talk about three things. Um, first, a little bit about what we're observing in the stakeholder space. So who are stakeholders and, and what do we see as their expectations? And then um, a bit about reporting or telling your story. And finally, just to finish on thinking beyond compliance. So um, that's the plan. So um, stakeholders, I mean, it, it feels like it should be a, a simple question, like who are your stakeholders? And um, Bethia mentioned that I've got a public sector background, and this feels like one of those questions we've been asking forever and trying to identify who they are, and you can end up with a really long list. And the list is getting more diverse um, as the sort of the current operating environment gets more complex. And I think particularly when we're operating in a, a digitally connected environment with social media um, having such such power in what we do. Um, last week at an IOD event in Auckland, we had a panel discussion about um, engaging with shareholders and stakeholders. And one of the um, initial points was around how do you define who your stakeholders are. And it used to be um, a focus on shareholders, consumers, employees. And then the list got longer and longer, and I've just you know, mentioned a few up there. And actually where, where the panel ended up was um, defining stakeholders as anyone who can impact, have an impact on your business. And I personally think that's a really good definition. Um, and I talk about business in the wider sense. That can be the services you deliver or whatever um, your business is about. So that's the context that um, we're talking about in terms of stakeholders. It includes shareholders, but it's definitely not exclusive to shareholders. And that, I would say, is probably quite a shift in where the corporate world is now from where it was some years ago. Certainly when I left um, public sector and went to the Institute of Directors four years ago, um, the, the environment there was probably more at the shareholder end in terms of a lot of the discussion and there was talk about stakeholders, and I've seen a, a real shift in the last um, few years, and I'll talk more about that. Um, one of the things I wanted to sort of highlight um, in terms of that shift for the Institute of Directors and why we see it as so important, um, so one of the things we do each year is we hold a director sentiment survey where we ask our members about things that are important to them. The last couple of years we've asked them whether they consider stakeholder interests to be very important to their business. Now we deliberately said very important because I think if you said important, then everybody would just go yes. Um, it was high in the first year that we asked. In 2016, 86% said that stakeholder interests were very important. Last year, it was 91%. And that sort of reflected back to us what we were picking up in terms of our operating environment and what we were hearing from, from directors. And, and you'll see that more in a bit. Um, so what we did um, for this year, so the Institute, um, 
what we do throughout our work program for the year is we'll have some particular themes that we focus our work around. So like last year, for example, we had a theme on digital capability because we, we knew that in boardrooms there was a, a lack of digital um, understanding, know-how and capability. This year we've got three themes and the first one this year is on shareholder and stakeholder engagement. So the event that I mentioned before in Auckland, that was one of the things that we were running for our members around this theme. So what's, what's key in this theme is that it's shareholder and stakeholder, and a lot of the events that have been organised and a lot of the commentary is focusing on that stakeholder, stakeholder end. Um, I think a good example of um, the expectations that we're seeing from stakeholders are summed up by Larry Fink. So he's the CEO of BlackRock, which is the world's largest, or at least one of the, the largest um, asset management um, fund managers. They have $6.3 trillion under management, and Larry Fink, for the last few years, has been writing to the CEOs of all the companies that they invest in, talking about their expectations as shareholders. What's interesting is that those expectations are getting broader and broader beyond financials, and that's, that's the common theme that um, I'll be talking about, and that I think from what I've picked up today, you've been hearing about as well. So um, the treasury model that was talked about bef before is a non-financial and financial model. And I'm, I'm very aware that in the public sector you work, operate in a, both a non-financial and financial model. What's different uh, for the corporate sector is the shift towards more of that. So um, I won't read that out because I think you've probably all had a chance to read it. Um, what I will add to it is that um, in his letter and the commentary accompanying that letter, Larry Fink has made it clear what the four priorities are that they are looking for in the companies that they invest in. And they are diversity, climate change, human capital and management, and executive pay. So those are four priorities that are not really about making money in the short sense, but they are in the long term. So, um, so what's this all got to do with annual reporting? So what it's got to do with annual reporting is that investors and other stakeholders, be they consumers, be they um, employees, are looking to understand what um, organisations and companies are about beyond the bottom line. And the annual report is a core opportunity to be able to um, engage and communicate with your stakeholders. And this is where you see this, this trend in more holistic reporting. So for, for you people in, in the public sector, you've, you've been working in this environment um, as your operating environment for some time. It's different for other sectors where it's new, where there are different forms of reporting that, that are new, and there's sort of like a bit of a catch up. Um, so I'm gonna talk in this part a little bit about um, the various forms of more holistic reporting and a little bit about the corporate governance guidance that's been coming out in New Zealand. And then a little bit about what we've been saying. So um, the next slide is to really try and illustrate that this isn't just a trend, I really see it as a bit of an onslaught. Now hopefully you're gonna be relieved to hear that I'm not gonna talk about all those frameworks. They're really just there to make the point that there's a whole lot of reporting frameworks out there that are beyond the financials. Um, and I, I, there are, what we're seeing, for example, in integrated reporting, which is one of those frameworks, is more and more take up of companies who are voluntarily adopting these frameworks because they tell their story in a more meaningful way. So um, New Zealand Post was the first New Zealand organisation to um, adopt integrated reporting. I know you're going to hear from Greg Taylor from KiwiRail about their story. There are listed companies like Sanford, um, Z Energy, who are also using integrated reporting. So they're doing that because those are the expectations of their stakeholders and shareholders, not because they're required to. So that's going to take us to my final report point around beyond compliance. Um, it, it struck me actually yesterday morning, I don't know if many of you heard um, Warren Allen on national radio, so he was talking about the research that the XRB and um, the McGuinness Institute have just released around um, 
extended external reporting, which is the last one there. And I didn't hear all of them, but, the, and, but what I did pick up on was um, two phrases, which I already had in my slides, so I sort of thought, oh, yes, I'm on target here, which was beyond financials and beyond compliance. Now, I think what's really, um, really sort of meaningful about that is that's the chief executive of our external reporting board talking on national radio about beyond financials and beyond compliance. That, to me, is showing where we're heading. It's, um, you know, your financial statements and financial position is only part of the story. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a much wider um, acceptance of that in other sectors now, not just the public sector. Um, and the other, the other um, point I was going to make, which felt extremely timely, um, was Grant Robertson, Minister of Finance, yesterday um, really announced the, the, governance, the government's new approach to the um, balance sheet, which you've just had a, a detailed talk about. Um, that, that level of detail was all new on me. What I picked up in his announcement was at the very high level that it's going to be more holistic, that's the term he used, and it's going to be focused on four capitals. So, you know, they talked about the finance, financial, human, social and natural capitals. So I picked up on that at a high level and thought, well, that's, that's actually an incredible step forward for our government. I mean, this will be leading in, in the world in terms of um, a more holistic approach. It's, it's got elements of integrated reporting, which has the six capitals. Again, you'll hear more about that later, but it's, it's showing a framework for the country that is a, a really progressive step forward. I mean, our public service is internationally recognised as progressive in this space, and I think this is the next step. So from the Institute's perspective, we're seeing these trends. We're seeing um, increasingly corporates being interested in environmental, social governance, um, reporting and disclosure, and um, you know, now we're seeing it at the government level here. So sort of to expand on that, um, I don't know if you're all familiar with um, two corporate governance codes that, that apply in New Zealand. So um, NZX released last year a new corporate governance code. They used to have an appendix called Appendix 16 in the listing rules, which was a couple of pages long. And um, they produced a new guide, which was a new code, which was modelled on the FMA's corporate governance handbook which is the one on the right, and which was released last month in a revised version. So what's, what's of real interest in those codes, and in the NZX one in particular, is that it's, um, it's lifting the game on non-financial information and disclosure. So it, it introduces um, ESG, Environmental Social Governance Disclosure and Reporting, and brings in a framework for our listed companies to comply or explain, which is a new framework um, operating here, and I think is meaningful in, in the context that it's not, um, it's not mandatory in the way that the listing rules are for listed companies. It's saying that this is what good practice is, but the expectations are that corporates will do this, that they will comply or explain. So it's, um, you know, we see it as list lifting the game, and it's in line with what's happening in other countries as well. So I don't know if, if any of you are sort of watching what's happening in the UK, but they're, they're undergoing some corporate governance reform at the moment. Um, they've had some big corporate failures, and that's driven some inquiries through their parliament. And the new corporate governance framework there has been dealing with issues like um, employee representation on boards. So that came up as a real question for the UK, is, is this a better way to improve governance? Um, hasn't got to that point yet, but there's a whole lot of um, developments underway which are looking at better corporate governance. So just to sort of um, come back a little bit to um, what, what sort of what part of the change at the Institute of Directors has been over the last few years while I've been there. Um, so in, in 2015, we put out a director's brief for our members which was entitled, What's the Future of Corporate Reporting? And we talked about um, some of those frameworks which were in the list before and raised questions because we, we felt at that time that um, 
the conversation was just starting and when you want to take people on a journey you you start a conversation rather than say this is you know what we think you should do we put out a brief this year the second one on that it's that slide which is um, integrated thinking a pathway to greater stakeholder engagement now I don't know if it's obvious to you but those two titles actually indicate a sort of a a couple of steps along a journey that we've taken, where now our members are talking about this all the time. There's a lot of adopt, um, early adoption of various standards or frameworks, and this is part of the um, discourse of, of particularly of our big companies and um, certainly established in, in other sectors as well. So um, to my final third area, which is um, beyond compliance, so I mentioned before, um, you know, hearing Warren Allen use those words yesterday on the radio and how personally um, heartening I found that because to me, um, although I've worked in um, OAG and, and with audit and I know the, and value the importance of reporting, what it's really all about is meaningful reporting that meets stakeholder expectations. And I think you have to take a mindset that is beyond compliance to um, you know, what, what is it that people want to understand or, or read from our reports or other ways of engaging? And it, it's really about helping build trust and confidence in the whole system, be that in corporates or be that in um, the public sector. And that takes me to um, my final slide, which is um, around trust. And I mean, you've heard a lot about that today, I understand, it's, and it's nothing new for you. Um, I don't know if you saw last week, but um, Acumen Elman released the 2018 Trust Barometer, um, and you've, you've probably heard commentary around the global crisis of, uh, in trust. So the, the barometer measures trust in, in four key areas, so government, media, business, and NGOs. Um, not, well... I don't think surprisingly, media is the one that fares the lowest. Um, government this time around for the New Zealand survey has actually seen a bit of a lift in, in one of the stakeholder groups. And um, business is not too bad, but there's a long way to go. I mean, there's a, there, is, there are levels of distrust that are not healthy and there is, um, there is work to be done. There's no doubt about that. What, what was particularly of interest um, for us as an institute and for our members was the, um, the results highlighted the need to show commitment to the long term, and for business in particular to act on wider societal issues. And that sort of links back to what Larry Fink was saying about broader issues. Um, one of the key stats that, that we have taken note of is that 44% of respondents said that companies that only think about themselves and their profit are bound to fail. So that comes back to that sort of loss of social license to operate that is at risk if you don't have that wider stakeholder support. Um, so to conclude, I think the, the key thing really that I see in this space is that understanding stakeholder expectations is critical, irrespective of what sector you're operating in or what type of entity you're working in. And I think we all need to think and engage more broadly. Um, we're definitely well beyond the financials telling, telling the story by themselves. Um, and it's not just about thinking more holistically, it is about thinking beyond compliance because we don't know what the next um, wave is gonna be. Whereas if you're thinking about what your stakeholders are expecting and how to engage meaningfully with them, and um, you see disclosure and reporting as an opportunity, then um, you know, that, that's the way forward.